Hi all, Dr. Clark here for Natural Resources. We're going to finish off uh, talking about food and nutrition with food production. Okay? So remember we were talking about nutritional needs, uh, starvation, phantoms, we're talking about um, instances of overeating in different countries and overproduction in different countries. Um, so now we're going to talk about food production in general and some possible new tools to help with food production or to benefit food production in um, developing countries but also in uh, developed countries. Okay? And the system that we're going to talk about is a system called CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR-Cas9 is a gene editing tool that we discovered um, in bacteria. So bacteria have this ability to take foreign DNA and uh, they can cut it and then fuse it into their own DNA, into their immune system's DNA. And then anytime that DNA registers, like a foreign body comes into them, they recognize it as being foreign DNA and they can destroy it. Well, this gene editing, by cutting it, their own DNA and placing it in there, we can take those tools, which we call CRISPR, we can take that tool and we can utilize it in organisms like even humans. And so we're going to look at food production from this point of view, but before we get to that we're going to talk about some other food production issues and, um, and move forward. Alright, so the facts that we dropped the number of people starving in the world is good, but the only way to do that is by increasing the amount of food that's produced. That should make sense given that the population since the 1960s has risen by almost 4 billion, no, almost 5 billion, and because in 60 it was 3 billion, and so it's almost 8 billion now. Um, so you have to, on top of that, you have to feed those extra 5 billion people, so you have to intensify your food production. Most of the time that means converting land to production of corn, wheat, soy, um, rice, barley, these other things. Okay? Um, and in some cases it's, you know, these grains and material to feed animals, especially in um, developed countries where meat products are eaten more often. By doing that, you're removing native plants and you're planting an annual plant, which means it you know, just grows and dies and it's not on the landscape for a long period of time. And every time you don't have a plant on the landscape, on a dirt patch, okay, that soil tends to erode. It blows away, it washes off during rainstorms, and you get a lot of soil er erosion and a lot of nutrients that run into the streams and then into the ocean. And um, we've already talked about those nutrient loads that can happen in those water systems. The other thing that can happen is after you've destroyed the land to grow food for the livestock, you then feed the livestock, but you also feed them, in most cases, antibiotics. So because you have a bunch of animals in a very small confined space, you don't want any of them to get sick, otherwise all of them will get sick. So you lace them up with a bunch of antibiotics so they, you know, resist bacterial infections, viral infections, you know, all kinds of things like that, fungal infections. But then all that manure right, has the potential to wash off into the stream. Now, that manure is still going to have bacteria in it, and most of the time those bacteria that are left are antibiotic resistant. So now you got these antibiotic resistant bacteria that are getting washed into the into the stream systems and can cause huge environmental damage. Okay? Not only do you have the nutrient load that's coming off the manure that's going in, so the nitrogen um, and the phosphorus that's coming off the manure that's causing you know, intense algae production or intense plant growth in some cases in streams 
but you also have these bacteria loads um, from you know E. coli and staph and things like that um, that are getting put into the water production also or into the stream also. Uh, and then, like I said before, you know, the more we use antibiotics, the more likely it is that um, a pathogen or a bacteria will develop antibiotic resistance. And the more you have, <clears throat> excuse me, the more you have bacteria that are antibiotic resistant, the more you have to use antibiotics, or right? the more different types of antibiotics you have to use. And so it's this evolutionary arms race. Okay? We fight the bacteria, the bacteria fight us, and then they just keep, you know, it keeps going like that, on and on and on, and pretty soon you get resistance that's formed, and then it's not possible to treat them with the same antibiotics. The problem with that is we haven't developed a new antibiotic in probably 20 years, so um, especially a new type of antibiotic. Now, sure, we can make little teeny changes to things like penicillin. So penicillin is a type of antibiotic, and um, you might get penicillin <coughs> for a bacterial infection. Right? Maybe you got strep throat or something like that. They give you penicillin, okay? Or maybe they give you a cousin to penicillin amoxicillin, okay, ampicillin, okay, there's lots of varieties of this and all it is is a little teeny chemical change. Okay? But that doesn't change really um, the type of antibiotic and so sometimes bacteria will be resistant to the entire family of that antibiotic and then it doesn't matter if you feed your livestock amoxicillin or ampicillin or penicillin um, it, it makes no difference, they're resistant to them all. Okay, so that can be a huge issue with food production, especially feedlots or CAFOs, um, you can see this issue happening at. Okay. So, in mainly in the 80s, a little bit before that, there's uh, kind of a, what we call a green revolution, uh, and it was this uh, kind of grow your own in your backyard and then um, not just that it was also to try to develop new crops okay, by either crossing things or by um, later in the 90s and the 2000s developing new crops based on GMOs or genetically modified organisms so there are new crops out there like you know this one here, this is a winged bee, bean, okay? The entire plant is edible, okay? The bean's edible, but also you can eat the greens, you can eat the flowers, everything like that. And, and um, there's a lot of situations where we have plants, tropical plants, or, or um, plants that we normally don't think of as food crops that are actually completely edible for humans. And we start to see that some of those crops are eaten. Um, although I probably would wage to bet that none of you have ate a winged bean. Um, it's not very common in the United States and um, so you often see these plants and things like that that are um, grown in de developing countries because they're easier grown and they don't care about the look or they don't care about the texture nearly as much as what you know developed countries do <clears throat> there's all kinds of things um, that are going on like mixing different crops okay? wheat and rye together to make a tricow um, and then like I said before at the very beginning okay, this new technology CRISPR Cas9 um, is a gene editing uh, kind of method that can help us develop new crops or develop new nutrient loads in, in our old crops. Okay? And we'll talk more about it in a second. So the Green Revolution has increased yields um, by far and it's normally trying to modify known crops or get new crops out there but modify them so that either they grow faster 
or they produce more seeds or they produce more fruit okay and so it's been a huge kind of increase in production in different regions of the world now there's a problem with that though okay? and so here's an example of that and we'll come to the problems in a second so here's an example so the average corn yield went from 25 bushels to 160 per acre okay? in you know the last century and so part of this has to do with better corn um, in the sense that I don't want to call it better corn but more productive corn so more more ears of corn per stock okay? shorter growing periods and so now we have corn that instead of taking uh, 90 to 100 days okay, it, it'll go to 60 okay? so in some cases depending on the region you can get two crops of corn um, the other thing is a lot of corn now are genetically modified organisms and so they're Roundup ready so they don't have to fight for weeds. You spray your entire field with Roundup, kill all the weeds, the corn still grows. They are more nutrient efficient. Uh, the other things that they are, they're freeze tolerant. So you can plant the corn when it's frozen. So you can get into the fields, plant the corn when it's still, when there's still a danger of frost and these corn can resist it okay? and um, so they get an earlier growing season so you can get two harvests off the field so the the production de has definitely increased and there's lots of ways at which this has increased I mean different things like tropical plants being grown now dwarf plant being grown mixes between plants being grown and so there's been a lot of research that have went into developing new products um, that taste or look exactly like the old products but they work better They're, they have more yield to them and you have to do that if you're going from 3 billion to 8 billion you have to up your game you have to up your production in some way and the way that we've been doing that is by crossing plants or growing different varieties and things like that and recently probably the last 20 years maybe 30 years um, it's been genetically modifying organisms so here you can see these semi dwarf wheats um, right? they they grow faster they produce a seed head faster so you can get a lot more crops in some cases you especially the ones that are winter tolerant you can grow a crop in the winter spring summer and fall so you can get four crops of wheat in one year okay? as long as the fields nutrients can um, stand that much growth now that's one of the major issues we have with the green revolution is that these high responders or these plants that grow extremely fast they have to have a massive amount of fertilizer okay? and again like I said before if you can control for the pests and you can control for weeds and things like that then you're automatically going to have more production so if you're you have less bugs eating up your field or less weeds competing for water and nutrients um, then you're probably going to have a higher yield anyways so having these plants that you can sprout spray roundup on them or you spray insecticides on them you're going to increase your yield on top of that if you can get a plant that produces more seed then um, you might need to utilize more fertilizer because those seeds are really just nutrients and they've got to get the nutrients from somewhere so you have to dump more fertilizer. This could be problematic for places you know that are developing because you know they get outcompeted and even in the United States where you have developed countries right, companies like Monsanto have developed seeds and and they have the right to do that um, they developed roundup ready seeds and and uh, freeze tolerant seeds and things like that and they sell them to farmers but they don't allow you to collect those seeds off your field and then replant you have to keep buying from them okay? it's a good method for the company because they make lots of money okay? and that's what a company does that's the purpose of most companies is to make money but on top of it 
poor farmers don't have the ability to buy these seeds. So if you're a poor farmer next to a semi-wealthy farmer, and I don't want to say rich farmers because most farmers are not rich, um, they might be wealthy enough to buy seeds, but if you're a poor farmer and you're growing a non-hybrid, a non-GMO, then the likelihood that you're going to compete with the farmer across the way, it's not good. Okay? Because they're getting, you know, you can see from 25 bushels to, you know, 100 and some bushels, they're getting four times, five times the amount of production that you would with that normal seed that you were, you were buying. So things like that, and the increase of fertilizers, the increase of pesticides, the increase cost of hybrid seeds or GMOs, okay, that can really have a major effect on the individuals who are just trying to make a living being a farmer. Okay? And we've seen this. Now, there might be a system that's going to change this and make it uh, a more even playing field, possibly. Okay? So genetic engineering we, we've kind of hinted on this and I just talked a little bit about it, but that means that you're going to change the genetic code of one organism by splicing DNA from another organism. Okay? So maybe you find a grass that is resistant to Roundup, and that's exactly what Monsanto did. They found a grass species that is resistant to Roundup found out what pathway and what genes that allowed for it to be resistant to glyphosate. That's the main product in Roundup. And then they took and they spliced the DNA from that grass into corn and soybean and wheat and a bunch of other um, organisms. And they made a what we call Roundup ready um, soybean or, or corn, etc. That's a genetically modified organism. So it has new traits, new traits that it would not have produced um, to begin with. <clears throat> now, a lot of people don't like GMOs because they think of, you know, as scientists messing with food and they're making things that are not um, natural, etc. Well, the, we can just start by setting the stage straight every single person in the United States for sure has consumed multiple GMOs every day. Even if you're a vegan and you only buy you know, natural produce or you only grow your own produce, you're still eating genetically modified organisms. Maybe not genetically modified in the sense of this definition where it's genetically engineering, okay? but definitely genetically modified. I mean, if you've ever looked at a piece of corn, okay, corn kernels, each one of those kernels is an offspring. Okay? Corn originated from a species in Mexico call, called tezanite. Okay? Now, Native Americans, Native Americans and Native um, Central Americans, they started breeding different varieties of tezanite together until they produced corn. Okay? Now, tezanite, you could probably, can't probably tell the difference between tezanite and something like wheat. Okay? And so they started with that and they just developed corn as we know it. Okay? And at first it had lots of different kernel colors and things like that and we call that Native American corn. Okay? But really eventually we just selected for the yellow corn kernels um, for some reason, people wanted yellow versus blue or red. Yellow was the, the secret there. Yellow doesn't occur nearly as often as the other colors, but that's what we selected for. Um, so still, nonetheless, it's a genetically modified organism. Nature would have never selected for species like corn because corn cannot reproduce on its own. It's not possible. It has to have the hand of man to reproduce. Okay? So that's still a genetically modified organism. And we can talk about all kinds of things. I mean, if you've ever ate broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, um, you know, anything like that, collard greens, if you've ever eaten any of those, they're all mustard. 
they all come from brassica, that genera. And it's all one species of plant that we have selected for separate genes to make broccoli or cauliflower, or Brussels sprouts, okay? And I'm not kidding you, it's all the exact same species, okay? They look very different, but we've genetically modified them to do that. So you're eating constant number of genetically modified organisms. So if you have an issue with it, um, really you would have to stop eating because otherwise um, you're going to have to consume a genetically modified organism. Maybe not a genetically engineered organism, but still even at that, that is so difficult to avoid because if you've ever e ate any processed food anywhere, you've ate a genetically modified organism. Okay. So what are the benefits? Uh, huge benefits. I mean, you can produce crops that are pest resistant. You can, again, freeze tolerant crops, drought tolerant. Um, you can increase nutrient load um, in the crop. You can increase their ability to withstand low nutrients or salty soils and all kinds of things. Okay, so you can do lots of things with the crop. Okay. You can incorporate oral vaccination. So this is one of the new procedures that we're trying to do, especially for developing na nations. We're trying to vaccinate the people in a crop that they would normally consume. So you don't have to go into the villages or go into the towns and give everyone a shot. Instead, you can just do vaccinations by breeding it into the genome of that crop. So the genetically modified organism would produce the vaccination and the organism who consumes it would get the vaccination. And I mean, brilliant things in my opinion, because I'm a scientist, is going on. Okay? The other things, you know, I mean, that we do constantly, we select for animals that can grow faster, produce more milk, produce higher protein levels, okay? all kinds of things. We can also induce pharmaceuticals into the milk products of things like cows or sheep or goats, depending on the country um, and what milk product they drink. If they drink milk, you can induce it in by changing the genome of the species. There's lots of ways that we can alter species for the benefit of humanity. Okay, and like I said before, this is kind of how, how, how you do it, is you find a donor organism uh, that has the sequence of DNA that you're interested in. Sometimes this is grown in the lab in bacteria, so maybe we have a vaccination and we have a way to fight off certain bacterial infections. Okay, so we would just have that in a bacteria cell like E. coli. We cut that out of the E. coli and we take that gene and insert it into a bacteria genome, grow it in bacteria, and then reinsert it into a plant species. So you insert it into the nucleus, it gets incorporated, okay, and then you can just grow um, what we basically call calluses, which is basically just a plant tumor. We can grow a callus and then we can grow that callus into a normal plant. Once it goes to maturity, we can select the seeds and then all the organisms from, grown from those seeds should have that DNA that we are interested in, in their genome. Um, this is a long process and you know Mon Monsanto gets a bad name and I'm not saying that they're a good company I'm not saying they're a bad company either it, you know there's a lot of information out there that says they're corrupt and that all they care about is money and they sue poor farmers and things like that um, a lot of that is true okay? but the other fact is is they went through this process to grow corn that you could spray Roundup on it and this is not easy. The diagram seems easy, but this is not easy. First, you got to find the gene, then you got to get it into the organism, and a lot of times it doesn't work. It, it fails to transfer. Um, so what can happen is you go through this, and you know this might take three months to try this with one gene, and it doesn't work. So now I have to find another one, another three months, another three months. And each three months is a million dollars. Okay? And so, you know, this, this process right here to find out Roundup Ready Corn, I'm guessing Monsanto spent, you know, tens of millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to figure it out. 
right? It took a long time and a lot of resources to figure out how to get that. Um, so them charging for the seeds, them not allowing farmers to reproduce the seeds and things like that, it's a pretty legit business. Now there are lots of concerns regarding GMOs. Um, you know, this is some of the worries that people have is that if you have GMOs that can resist weed killer, then can't some of the pollen spread from the field into nearby weeds and you can develop super weeds? Um, yes, you can, and we already have. Um, by doing this, will you increase the or decrease the native biodiversity? Absolutely, in some cases, especially um, plants that we're growing that do not need to be pollinated. Okay, so we have ways at which we can grow a GMO that has no need to be pollinated and will still produce a fruiting body. Okay, so you might get rid of native bees by doing that. Um, and on top of that, you've plowed over the fields so the native bee population has really nothing to consume. The other thing that can happen is you can get mixing between genetically modified organisms and you know organisms that occur on the outskirts of the field and it can make for um, kind of a reduction in genetic diversity also. Um, it's possible that by producing GMOs we don't know the downfield effect of inserting that gene so you could create novel toxins these are heavily tested um, for the levels of toxicity and things like that in the seeds and before their people are able to eat it but it's possible um, and then one of the main concerns is that a lot of this technology is for the rich um, wealthy farmers are going to outcompete uh, poor farmers and um, you know the concern is nations that are already in poverty could be further in poverty and those developed nations could be selling the food to these poor nations and there would, no be, would not be any farmers in those poor nations any longer. And like I said before, you're already eating GMOs. Um, about 60% of all processed food in the United States contains um, some GMO. Uh, so if you've ever ate at uh, a fast food restaurant, you ate a GMO, guaranteed. Now transcendent crops or genetically fed organisms, um, this is interesting because there are multiple ways at which you can modify the genes of an organism. Now, GMOs, most people don't like genetically modified organism. Um, well, I shouldn't say most people. There's a lot of people out there that are afraid of it and afraid of what it's going to do. But like I said before, the transensic uh, crops can be engineered to do lots of things, tolerate high levels of pesticides, herbicides, uh, lots of different things. And I already said, you know, Roundup Ready, there's also Liberty Link which is another type of um, herbicide that's you know similar to Roundup but uh, you know the purpose is the same grow your crop spray the entire field so you don't have to selectively spray weeds you spray the entire field the crop stays the weeds die pretty simple process All right. um, is it safe well maybe maybe not um, you know, a lot of people will call it Franken foods and things like that. Um, there has been some bans on GMOs in, in Europe. There is concern in some cases about it, but in the United States, there is no need to even label that the food contains a GMO. So you could be eating something that has a GMO in it, and the US Food and Drug Administration did not require that you label it. So <clears throat> it depends on what you what you think. I mean, we've been doing this for a long time. We've been modifying organisms for a long time. Now we're using genetically engineered organisms more often. And uh, is it a Frankenfood? Of course it is. 
Okay? Of, of course it is. You're using the combination of multiple genomes of different organisms to make one organism that you eat. Um, but this is no different than, say, mixing lines of chicken or making beefalo. Uh, so crossing a buffalo and a beef together and making beefalo. It, there's really no difference except for we're doing it in a lab and then transferring that DNA into a plant species. Um, you might have issues with herbicide and pesticides and things like that and that's quite fine because I have issues with those also but having issues with genetically engineered organisms would mean that you have an issue with all the food you eat. Uh, now we do see though that some of the genetically modified organisms have been able to spread to the weed production. Okay? Most of them don't survive outside and most of the time if it's genetically engineered the right way it means that it won't reproduce after it reproduces a single crop and that's that's purposely designed that way by the seed companies because then you couldn't collect your own seeds and regrow it. Now in some cases the technology is not there and you could collect the seeds and regrow them although, although it's against the law for most of those companies um, it's against their policy and against their law and they will find you and fine you and sue you and take all your money but um, a lot of times the GMOs don't grow very well outside of the growing season okay? so they'll die off um, but we have seen some things that um, can transfer. I mean, we have genetically modified organisms like salmon, which grow seven times faster than any wild salmon. We grow these in aquaculture. They do have the chance of escaping. Sometimes they have escaped. And the worry is that if they mix with native populations, then you could alter the gene of the native salmon. Okay? But on top of it, what if they don't mix, but they just outcompete the native populations? Then you could have a you know a native population that really suffers because of you know these um, increased growth rates of these salmon. Okay? So when we talk about genetically modified organisms, we need to talk about the newest technology, and we're going to watch a little video about CRISPR-Cas9 okay, and its role. Now, before when we were talking about genetically modified organisms, we have to find the gene from a different organism and insert it into the organism we want to grow or mass produce. With CRISPR-Cas9, CRISPR all we have to do is indicate what the genetic code from that other organism is. So what's the ATCG sequence? Okay. And then we can go in and we can make our own DNA sequence to read that. So you're just changing the native sequence of the plant to match either being Roundup ready, grow fast, um, reduce rot, these different things. And right now, the USDA does not recognize organisms that have their genes being edited by Casper, CRISPR Cas9 as GMOs. So this is good news for at least um, food production companies because if you can alter the genetic code by just changing the ATCs and Gs Okay, to match what you would want from another organism. It's faster, it's cheaper, okay? and on top of it, it doesn't get labeled as a GMO, so you can sell it in you know, nations in Europe, and you can sell it all over the world as a natural system. Okay? Now, you might argue that it's still a genetically modified organism. Uh, I do. I argue it still is a genetically modified organism, but I don't have an issue with genetically modified organisms. Um, so we're going to watch this little video and then um, you, you can be the judge of what you think about CRISPR-Cas9 and its role in 
food production. Hi, my name is Lynn Pfeiffer of 365 Days of Baking and More. And instead of being in the kitchen, I'm on a journey for best food facts to understand CRISPR technology. We are not talking about the CRISPR drawer in your fridge. CRISPR technology is a simple yet powerful tool that enables scientists to edit DNA sequences. This form of gene editing holds promising applications such as curing and preventing diseases and improving foods. My exploration of this subject started with food scientist and CRISPR researcher, Dr. Rodolf Barangu. As a food blogger, I get a lot of my followers coming to me asking for diabetic recipes, gluten-free recipes, and allergenic recipes. How does CRISPR fit into that? If you are allergic, we can make gluten-free wheat. Wow. Right, we can make hypoallergenic nuts. If we know what the gene is, we can take it out or turn it off or turn it down. And that's exactly what Dr. Jessica Lyons and her team are researching at the University of California, Berkeley. Their research is focused on using CRISPR technology to remove a deadly compound in the cassava plant. Cassava is a really important staple crop for about 800 million people in tropical and subtropical regions of the world. So this is a map that shows places in the world where stunting in children under the age of five is most prevalent. Stunting is the result of when children are malnourished, especially in the first thousand days of life. So if you take this map and you look at where the stunting is occurring and you overlay where cassava is grown here in the green, what I hope you can see is that cassava has the potential to be a really important tool in trying to combat food insecurity. Here in the U.S., we know it is yucca. But in third world countries, if the cassava plant isn't processed correctly, it can have terrible consequences. The cassava plant contains cyanide and that can, that can poison a person. People who eat plenty of protein in their diet, the cyanide is not as much of a threat. But for people who are really, you know, they don't have much to eat besides cassava, then the cyanide poisoning is more, more of a threat. So it's not much of a threat here in the United States? No, it's not. I had no idea about the cyanide in cassava. How is the CRISPR technology going to help with that? What we're going to do is we're going to use CRISPR as a tool. We're going to knock out a couple of genes that are important for the cyanogenesis pathway, and that way we're going to engineer cassava that doesn't contain cyanide. Why is this research important to you? I've been the recipient of a great deal of privilege in my life, and I'm aware of that. My work on projects like this are a great opportunity to use the knowledge and the resources and the skills that I have to have a positive impact on the world. A small part of, of making the world a better place, right? Helping people. Exactly. Yeah. After my series of conversations with researchers, it is clear to me CRISPR technology has the potential to make a positive impact on the world in human health, disease prevention in animals, and food improvements. And that's only a few of the possibilities. While I get back to baking, I encourage you to remain curious, be open-minded, and learn all that you can about CRISPR technology. I'm Lynn Pfeiffer for Best Food Facts. Okay. So that was CRISPR-Cas9 and its role that it could play in food production. It already has, for that matter. Um, there's a team uh, out of ooh, MIT, I think, that made a um, you know uh, white button mushrooms that you would get at a grocery store. They CRISPR-Cas9 them to reduce the amount of browning so it increases the time that they stay white and so for people that like mushrooms that's a good thing right um, <clears throat> but overall there's all kinds of situations that you could use this editing software for now you no longer need to find an organism that you can extract the DNA from to implant it in a plant or another animal you can alter the genome of that animal directly and it's going to take it's going to work as long as the animal has the capabilities of producing that protein or capability of producing that nutrient or maybe that organism is toxic and you want to remove the toxin so you block the production of toxin there are hundreds of thousands of organisms out there that are high in 
protein or high in different um, nutrients that we as humans could consume and that would grow on the landscape really well but are toxic they're poisonous so instead of learning about that you could go in with CRISPR Cas9 remove their ability to produce toxins grow them on the landscape and now you have a new food crop okay? one that might produce extra proteins or extra um, carbohydrates or whatever it might be okay? so CRISPR Cas9 we talked about it a little bit before and its potential to rid the world of malaria but it also has the potential to really change the world's production of food er eradicate most diseases but there's also some scary side effects or scary pieces of CRISPR-Cas9 is it really could allow people to create what we call superhumans or gene edit organisms, um, humans, so that they're super athletes or, and that's probably the first thing that's to come. Um, so I urge you to you know, think about CRISPR-Cas9, watch some other videos. There's tons of videos on YouTube about CRISPR-Cas9, ones that go into great detail about how it works, etc. And I'd just let you, like to let you know that there are countries now, Japan, um, that have no regulations on CRISPR-Cas9. So they can use CRISPR-Cas9 to edit human genomes. They've already done this. Okay? They um, had human em embryos that were infected with disease, okay, some genetic disorder, and they removed it and replaced the gene that caused the genetic disorder with a normal gene, and the embryo um, was devoid of that disease. Um, you know, when when the organism was born, it did not have that genetic disorder. Okay. That is some cool stuff. It's, it's a way that we can get rid of a lot of things that um, alter you know, the livelihood of people all over the world and fairly cheaply. CRISPR-Cas9 is a real kind of cheap technology. Um, well, when it's in mass production, it's really easy. The issue is, though, that it's going to be used for purposes that you might not see fit like you know producing super athletes or super smart individuals and things like that once the the genes are figured out okay with that next time we're going to talk about um, energy and we'll start looking at the different types of energy renewable non-renewable these kind of things and the benefits and costs of energetics all right next time